Picture this, a room packed with 200 people, four judges, and just under four minutes to explain your science. That's what our eight contestants faced last week at the Art of Talking Science. Check out the video of our winning presenter, Dr. Patrick Perdon. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Patrick Purden. I'm a researcher in the uh, Department of Anesthesia here at Mass General. So, uh, 170 years ago, the world witnessed the first demonstration of general anesthesia for surgery. In uh, the years since then, uh, and, and every day today, uh, tens of thousands of patients undergo anesthesia for surgery. But, uh, but it's curious that uh, until a few uh, years ago, we really didn't understand how anesthetic drugs cause states of unconsciousness. Uh, and in fact, this has uh, tremendous practical consequences because if you can't understand how the drugs are working, how can you measure the drug effects and how do you know how much drug to give? Are the patients too light, you know, possibly um, perceiving things uh, during the surgery, or are they too deep, possibly receiving more drug than they need? So this is a central question that we try to answer uh, in uh, our lab. Um, so we know that the drugs are acting on the brain, and the brain, uh, you know, you can think of it uh, as this very complex machine uh, that has many different moving parts that all have to work together in a in a, a kind of highly coordinated fashion. You know, you might imagine it's sort of like a uh, like an orchestra or something. So many different instruments that have to play together in a coordinated fashion. So um, if we were to uh, uh, think about this, you know, every uh, different part of the brain has its own musical score, and it's probably improvising a little bit. And, and let's imagine listening to one part of the brain in particular, say that red part over there. So we're listening, it might be like, fly me to the moon, <laughs> let me play among the stars, something like that, right? So let's chill and have a good time. Now, um, if we add the anesthetic, what happens is that the notes kind of drop out. The music is drastically simplified. So it might be more like, fly, moon, <laughs> stars, <laughs> Jupiter. <laughs> and every part of the brain, it turns out, is sort of in this pattern where it can only play certain notes and, and they're all sort of discoordinated. So as a result, uh, the brain is no longer active in any given region correctly and it, it doesn't communicate uh, across different brain regions. And that's what we think is going on when uh, uh, patients are unconscious under anesthesia. Now the cool thing is that if you heard the, the little example, I was singing in a monotone, so there was just one note. And actually that's a, a huge part of what we learned. So it turns out that um, uh, different anesthetic drugs, well, well anesthetic drugs in general, they, they constrain the brain to play only a handful of notes, and every drug plays a different set of notes. So for example, this is actual brain activity under anesthesia, recorded in operating rooms. So I can take you there now, we can see this. Um, so three different drugs, ketamine, dexmedetomine, propofol, and so I've stacked, what's happening is that the, the uh, activity is in time this way, and I've stacked up the brain activity like a keyboard. So low notes down here, high notes up here, okay? And so now you can kind of see that, that the different drugs are playing different no notes. So ketamine is a, a, a drug that provides pain relief, and um, uh, it's a, it produces a hallucinatory, a hallucinatory state, so it plays a lot of high notes, like <laughs> uh, and, and it's, it's, it puts people in kind of a confusing state, state of mind. So this dexmedetomine drug, it puts you in a more sedated state, and you can see there's this one note there, and it's got, kind of being played intermittently, so one note, intermittently, one note, and you're kind of relaxed and chilled out. And this propofol, look, it's two big notes, and it's like, bam, you know, really powerful. You need that to be unconscious during everything that's going on in surgery. So you can imagine that different patients respond to the different drugs in different ways. You're a baby, you know, grandma, they respond differently. So the cool thing that we can do now is really personalize the anesthetic care. Read these brain waves that I just showed you that reflect the ideal states of of unconsciousness, and we can provide the exact right dose. Thank you. Okay, let's start with where they said that, let's have a Ooh, talk about like taking a metaphor that works and running with it all the way. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I would say it really, really worked right up till the very end when I wanted you to extend it, um, believe it or not, even a little farther and explain <laughs> what exactly you can do now. So you explained that you could detect, um, but then, then what? Okay, so then it was a very quick finish. And so we can therefore, you know, tailor your drugs individually. I was like, 
Oh, really? Like, yeah, that, I might need four more minutes. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, wow, well done. Anna? I, I, I was uh, thinking about that. I, I was so captivated by what you were telling me towards the end. I wish you had locked off the first maybe 30 seconds of it because that horrified me, actually, to think that you really didn't understand how I was <laughs> 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 That is horrifying. Um, but I understand that in, in terms of research and experimentation. That, so now that you've gone to the, I, I needed, personally, as a lay person, I needed to understand a little bit more what I was looking at in those charts. I, I, I was grateful for the keyboards, and I wanted to make certain that the, the music actually matched what you were singing. You know, but, you know we, we don't need to get into that, but I needed some real explanation of what I was seeing there. I, I liked the overlay of the metaphor. Again, I would have liked to have gone further. Tell me what I should be asking for when I go under next time. <laughs> Then. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, certainly clarity, and, and definitely, I love, I love seeing the keyboards, and I kind of just agree. I, I would have loved to see, like, maybe at the end, like the two hands, the, the baby and the older person, and on one hand, you, you know, you've got uh, Jimi Hendrix, and the other side, <laughs> the Miller Orchestra, but, you know, so, like, you know, what? Maybe, maybe that would have brought us home to, like, oh, right, this is the kind of thinking that you, you, you got. What, what orchestra is going to be playing during this? Uh, you know. Aesthetic experience. Uh, I, I mean, having you know written about uh, anesthesia research myself, I know that this is tough, and and I think there. I think the other judges are being pretty pretty hard on you. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> no, sure. Honestly, no, 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 no. Because like I'm looking at it, and I'm like, yeah, that, right, of course. Like, what a good creative metaphor. Like, yeah, I haven't totally. seen. I haven't seen that before. I've seen. There's the you know there are metaphors that everyone sort of passes around and then they become cliches and there's a lot of cliches in science writing and you didn't go for the cliches you like thought about this creatively you used visual uh, you made used a visual metaphor which is which is even better um, yeah and you can sing which that helps <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I agree that if you could just have just sort of said like well you know why would you want a different kind of melody in your brain. For different things, I don't know. I did, you didn't tell me that. That I, I do want. I, I do leave this wondering that, but I also leave thinking of a great figure of speech. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.